Hi, welcome to Chemical Bonding. My name is Dr. English. Today we're going to talk about bond polarity and electronegativity. Specifically, we're going to look at rules for determining bond polarity, the character of the bond, bond polarity and ionic bonds, nonpolar covalent bonds, polar covalent bonds, and finally, bond polarity example. Let's start out by talking about bond polarity and electronegativity. Taking the difference of the electronegativity values of two atoms in a bond allows us to generally classify the bonds as either ionic or covalent. So there are certain rules that we can follow, and depending on the textbook that they use, these rules can vary. If the electronegativity difference is greater than or equal to 1.7, the bond is classified as ionic, but keep in mind, the bond must be made up of positively and negatively charged ions. If the electronegativity difference is less than or equal to 1.6, the bond is classified as covalent. The bond is composed of only nonmetal atoms. So we can see this image below. We have nonpolar covalent bonding, which we'll talk about more in a little bit polar covalent bonding where electrons are shared unequally, and then finally ionic bonding, which we just referred to where electrons, as we know, will be transferred from our metal to our nonmetal. And we refer to this as increasing ionic character. Let's talk about the character of the bond. If there's a large difference in electronegativity, the bond has more ionic character. Now note, the electronegativity difference may indicate that the bond is covalent and or two nonmetals are involved in the bond. A small difference in electronegativity values, the bond has less ionic character. So the phrase more covalent character is typically not used. So an ionic bond as we see up here, we know again that electrons are transferred this will have the greatest ionic character. In other words, we're forming ions. Polar covalent bonding, which we'll talk about more in a moment, are when electrons are going to be shared unequally. And finally, nonpolar covalent bonding, which we'll talk about next, the electrons are shared equally between the two atoms. So one more time, bond polarity and ionic bonds. An ionic bond is the electrostatic force of attraction between a positive and negative ion. This is formed when an electron is transferred from a less electronegative element to a more electronegative element. Specifically, our less electronegative elements in our ionic bonds are typically our metals, like we see here with the sodium giving up its one valence electron to chlorine, and of course transferring it to chlorine, which is our nonmetal, and will readily accept that electron to get its full octet. So sodium becomes Na plus 1, and Cl becomes minus 1, and then we can form that ionic bond. Now let's talk about a nonpolar covalent bond. A covalent bond between two atoms with the same electronegativity values. Both atoms share the bonding electron pair, forming the covalent bond equally. The electronegativity value difference in the bond must be zero, and we'll practice this in class. The nonpolar covalent bond is said to have a symmetrical charge or electron distribution within the bond. In Regents Chemistry, the primary examples that we use of nonpolar covalent bonds is referring to our diatomic molecules, N2, O2, H2, F2, Cl2, Br2, and I2. These will all have nonpolar covalent bonds. And we can see that nonpolar covalent bond if we take something like H2. We know hydrogen has one valence electron, so we'll put another hydrogen here, give its valence electron, and those two valence electrons are going to be shared equally, an equal pull in both directions by those hydrogen atoms. And I can look at electronegativity values. I know that hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.2. So if I give each of these hydrogen atoms with their one valence electron electronegativity values of 2.2 and I subtract them from each other, I can see that the overall difference is going to be zero. Therefore, this bond right here is classified as a nonpolar 
covalent bond. Now let's talk about a polar covalent bond. A covalent bond between two different nonmetal atoms will have a polar covalent bond. Since different atoms are involved in polar covalent bonds, the electronegativity values, as we know, are listed on table S, will be different. A difference in electronegativity values results in unequal sharing of the electrons within the covalent bond. The polar covalent bond is said to have an asymmetrical charge or electron distribution within the bond, as we can see from this model below. We have the hydrogen, and I'll draw a hydrogen right here with its one valence electron, and then we have a chlorine with its seven valence electrons. So here's my chlorine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we can form that covalent bond between the hydrogen and the chlorine. But the hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.2. The chlorine will have an electronegativity of 3.2. So the difference between those two is one. Therefore, again, we would classify this bond as a polar covalent bond. So as soon as you see that difference in electronegativity, polar covalent bond. That's how we roll in New York State. Bond polarity and electronegativity. The greater the electronegativity difference, the more polar the bond. So in other words, the greater the ionic character of the bond. The shared electron pair is drawn closer to the high electronegativity atom resulting in a polarized bond, otherwise known as a dipole, where di means two and pole means, you know, pole. So two poles, a positive pole and a negative pole. The atom with greater electronegativity gains a partial negative sign. And we use this symbol right here, a lowercase sigma, which looks like an S that got a little crazy. The atom with lesser electronegativity gains a partial positive charge. So again, we do that lowercase sigma that looks like this with a little plus sign. And this one should have a little negative sign. So let's look at a worked example. Polar covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen in water. So I'm just gonna draw a quick structural diagram of water and we know that water looks something like this and it has two non-bonding pairs of electrons, otherwise known as lone pairs. And if I was to assign electronegativity values to this, it would be 2.2 and 2.2 and oxygen is 3.4. So the oxygen is definitely a lot more electronegative than the hydrogen is. So we're gonna give the oxygen a slightly negative sign, while the hydrogens will get a slightly positive sign because they are less electronegative. So because we have a difference of 3.4 and 2.2, we can see the difference in bond polarity is 1.2, which would make this a polar covalent bond, PCB, polar covalent bond. So that is what we are seeing right here. And of course, right here. Both of these would be considered polar covalent bond. And we want to use that full term, not just polar bond, but polar covalent bond. Let's look at another example. Which bond is most polar? The OH bond in water, the SH bond in H2S, or the SEH bond in H2SE. So let's assign electronegativity values. The oxygen we know is 3.4 and the hydrogen is 2.2. The sulfur is going to be 2.6, hydrogen is 2.2, and the selenium is gonna be 2.6 and the hydrogen is 2.2. So the difference, as we can see from above, between the oxygen and the hydrogen, 3.4 minus 2.2, that's going to be 1.2. That's the difference there. The difference in electronegativity between 2.6 and 2.2 is going to be 0.4. And because I was really original, I picked uh, elements with the exact same values. So again, the difference here is going to be 0.4. So when we talk about which bond is the most polar, we're looking for the greatest difference in electronegativity values. So what did you learn? We talked about the rules for determining bond polarity the character of the bond, bond polarity and ionic bonds, nonpolar covalent bonds, polar covalent bonds, 
and a bond polarity example at the end. Need more help? Feel free to contact me. Have a great day.